Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Adrian Zadunczyk, founder of The Burb Nest, talking to us about cryptocurrencies and some other big picture themes as well. We've talked a lot about rotation between offense and defense, between leading sectors and lagging sectors. We'll talk with Adrian and review some of the charts together and see what sort of themes we can uh, tease out. Overall, choppy day, S&P slightly negative, NASDAQ slightly positive. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. It always impresses me when I see people learn the technical toolkit for the first time and just all of a sudden, it's like a light. The lights have been off this whole time, and all of a sudden, they're sort of turned on as all of a sudden you have an awareness. And I would say you don't always have all the answers. I wish I could tell you we do. We don't. We have an idea of where things should go based on what I call a probabilistic analysis, based on the analysis of trend and momentum, breadth and sentiment. We have an idea of where the winds are blowing, where the tides are going. But in the end of the day, individual moments can be tough to navigate, but I have found charting and technical analysis to be a really good way to have peace of mind and have a good understanding of what's happening. If you've ever had question marks as to what's going on, I would argue charts and a consistent process of analyzing charts can really help eliminate some of those confusing moments for you. On this uh, show, we like to sort of tease out what happened through the course of the trading day, connect as best as we can the moment to moment movements, what we call the flickering ticks with more of the longer term themes and reflect on what sort of rotations we've seen. As we'll see from the charts here, a bit of a choppy day, but at the end of the day, a lot of those trends that have been in place continue to go, right? The long side continued to work. Names like Apple still going up. Get nervous when stocks stop going up, not when they continue going up is my general way of approaching things as a trend follower. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and look at what's happened through the course of the trading day today. I do want to start with a poll, by the way. And we always have a poll going on our YouTube uh, page. If uh, Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get it there. Also on our social media accounts on Twitter and elsewhere. Which ETF performs best over the next three months? No right answer to this one at the moment. The right answer will be filled in in the next three months. But clean energy, the FANG stocks, sort of those mega cap leadership names, oil and gas and gold. And when we set up this, this question, it's always interesting to think about what, what ETFs I can give you a choice for and see which ones you'll, you'll be interested in. I wanted to like basically make the case for the FANG stocks or anything else and look for some other areas of the market that have been certainly underperforming in a, in a while to see if people were looking for a mean reversion on that trade. 44% of you, the most common answer was to stick with the leadership. And I, I can't I, I get the argument there for sure, right? It's hard to fight trends like Apple and Meta and others when they're in a position of strength. I 100% get it. What's interesting is when you think about what could happen over the course of the next three months, well, probably a couple rate hikes from now, three months down the road, gold and energy have been struggling for quite some time. Do we get a bid in those areas of the market? Clean energy has been probably the worst performer of this basket, would be my guess. Do you get a big mean reversion to the upside? Because both old energy and new energy are all uh, sort of struggling. Thanks, stocks getting the most uh, the most common answer. And when we're looking at the FNGS ETF, which again, it's not not necessarily my favorite uh, ETN. It's actually not an ETF. It's an exchange traded uh, an ETN, not an ETF, an exchange traded fund. Uh, and so I, I would do your due diligence as always on things. But what I like about FNGS is it captures that index pretty well in an ETF like wrapper. So it gives you a good sense of uh, the trend. And when you look at the trend. The trend is up. Now, can we can I do you want me to tell you reasons why the trend should not go up anymore? Sure. I can come up with you reasons about it being overextended and the fact that the market was over, you know, the price was overbought. And now it's not uh, the fact that it's outperformed for so, so long. It's been so far away from its 200 day moving average. There are plenty of reasons why a trend should mean revert. But I would encourage you that there's a big difference between what should happen and what actually is happening. And price analysis is about what is actually happening. Buyers and sellers coming together, that is fact. And so looking at the uh, reversal in the trend, a brief pullback in the FNGS along with the rest of the mega cap sort of growth trade, but a bit of a bounce uh, here over the next, uh, the next the, the last couple sessions. So overall, I'm inclined to assume that that trend continues until proven otherwise. And I haven't seen enough in that chart uh, to suggest to me that the trend is proven otherwise at this point. With that in mind, let's look elsewhere for our market recap. We'll start with the major equity indexes. You'll see sort of a diversified color palette here. 
with red to green, some things up, some things down. It wasn't a huge directional day. I sort of call this a digestion day. Think of the last couple of days as your big meal, and now you're sort of sitting back and letting the Thanksgiving dinner kind of uh, settle in a bit, uh, watching some football on TV perhaps. The S&P essentially flat for the day, right? A lot of choppiness. Directionally, what happened? Well, it sort of rallied into the close, and so end of the day, just below 4380, uh, around 4377. That's literally almost exactly where we finished the day yesterday. Dow down by about a quarter of a percent. The Nasdaq up by about a quarter of a percent. What's interesting is if we we look underneath the hood and we'll look at some individual names like uh, some cruise lines, uh, you know, up big. Look at uh, consumer staples like food products actually down big today. So plenty of movements surrounding these uh, these general trends. But that's what we're seeing uh, just in the, uh, in the short term today. Same thing, mid caps, small caps, directionally, not a lot to uh, to speak of. And the Nasdaq 100 was up about 0.1%, so not much. What's interesting is, as we had sort of a lighter directional day, meaning we didn't really move up or down, but sort of sideways, the VIX, the volatility picture continues to go down, right? And so what we, I, I think the, the, the environment that we continue to be in is a slow and steady uptrend, very, you know, very uh, strong echoes of 2021, an uptrend uh, with clear leadership, particularly the mega cap growth trade and volatility fairly low, if not extremely low uh, relative to the last 12 to 18 months, which is we're sort of in that slow and steady uptrend. Now, the one thing that changes here, or I guess two things, is the price reverts lower and volatility increases. Today, you're not seeing those signs. So there may be a time when this trend reverses. That day is not this day. <laughs> Let's look at the yield curve overall moving lower. So you can see the 10-year yield down just above 3.7%. Long bond yields just above 3.8%. The five-year yield is back below 4%. Uh, so we're seeing overall the yield curve come down. Uh, I was talking with my guest yesterday, uh, Ms. Schneider, about the yield curve, among other things, uh, talking about inflation, talking about material stocks and commodities. You know, overall, I, a lot of things I think that we will learn over the next six to eight weeks as we have, uh, you know, a couple of Fed meetings, uh, uh, comments today sort of, you know, indicating that there's plenty of appetite for hiking rates. And, and certainly when you have strong economic data, like we saw earlier this week, that certainly I think gives the Fed license to do whatever and whenever they want to continue to try to slow the economy. For now, yields coming off a bit. Uh, bond prices, of course, going higher in that in that scenario. And the dollar index up by about a half a percent from yesterday's close. In the commodity space, mostly in the red, although crude oil prices actually bumped higher and the energy sector actually had a pretty decent update. Uh, but overall, the commodity uh, ETF DBC was down about a third of a percent. Gold and silver, uh, certainly copper prices uh, down as well. So overall, we're certainly continuing to see a rotation away from uh, gold and silver. It's tough, by the way, in that poll to vote for something like gold stocks when they've struggled, right? When you're in an environment where they're just struggling, you really have to think that we would be a very different scenario in the next three months to cause a mean reversion to the degree that uh, that uh, that there may be. But that that can certainly happen. Let's not count that off. For now, though, uh, gold, I would say, and silver, both at the lower end of a channel and now breaking below channel support. And we talked about that uh, trend line analysis uh, on last week's show. I'm very excited to have uh, our guest today, Adrian Zadunchik, one of the best that really understands the crypto space. And it's a pleasure to learn from someone like him really focusing on that area of the market, among other areas. And, you know, a lot of volatility in the crypto space. So if you're if you're hungry for vol and you're looking for where to go, cryptocurrencies probably won't disappoint you. What are we seeing today? So Bitcoin actually pulling back by about two and a quarter percent, right above 30,000. And that's a big round number we've talked about a number of times here. So very curious to think about what the trajectory could be uh, from here. Ether price is just below 1830. That's down just over 3%. So all the 10 uh, most liquid uh, coins that we're tracking on our platform down over the last uh, 24 hours or so. Uh, but overall, within the context of strength that we've seen off of the lows earlier this year, for sure. Finally, looking at sector movements, we have energy at the top of the list, up 1%, which isn't a huge day, but relative to a flat S&P is actually a pretty decent uh, update. We'll take it for energy. Again, the, the charts of energy stocks and of the energy sector, I think, still have a lot to prove. These are bouncing off of fairly weak levels uh, here in the short term this week. Communication services, consumer discretionary, the XLC and XLY, both up about uh, 0.4 to 0.5%. On the downside, defensive sector utilities down in a big way, 1.5% uh, lower. Materials down 0.7%. Consumer staples down 0.7% as well. So we did a webcast uh, yesterday talking about uh, what I call the market top checklist, looking at key uh, levels and key patterns that often happen 
you know, before, during, and after major market tops. And one of the key things that's in sort of that middle, what I call a structural change, would be a rotation away from the previous leadership into some defensive areas of the market, or at the very least into different leadership. And that is one thing we are notably not experiencing yet. It's growth still at the uh, in the driver's seat, particularly the mega cap growth stocks. Um, things like energy and materials, which could work, uh, are working in a in a little you know in, in small ways, but not really rotation ro- rotating just yet. And defensive areas of the market are still underwhelming, right? I mean, utilities, consumer staples, still doing a lot worse than uh, than the S and P. The relative strength lines are going down, as we highlighted on the show yesterday. Uh, and so overall, I think more of the same through the course of the day uh, today. Let us look at a chart of the S&P 500 and see what we can see. What did today do to the overall trend? I mean, not much. I I mean, I would say in terms of what we've learned over the last couple days is we have a trend that overall is fairly constructive. The S&P blew through 4,300 to 4,325. That's that pink shaded area on our charts. I think that's a key level of potential support. It was certainly an objective to the upside because that's the August 2022 high. Also a uh, key Fibonacci level. We broke through that a couple of weeks ago and then pulled back. We topped out right around 44.50, pulled back, and now potentially making a higher low this week. And I think that could be really important. I, I love to use in this sort of environment what I call the line in the sand technique. I am not a fan. My goal is, uh, I mean, there's a reason why my column on stock charts is called the mindful investor. I want to worry less and be less anxious and just have some very clear game plan, some clear steps, some clear checks I need to check off. And until those checks are, are made, I don't have to worry about things. And, and being less anxious about uh, the market and where things are headed is, is the way I want to live my life as much as possible. So in this sort of environment, when we're in an uptrend and we start to pull back, it's the line in the sand. What's that level? What's that signal? What's that trigger that until we break that, the conditions are still OK? And in my opinion, in the short term, that level's 4,300. If we pull back, which we did over the last uh, couple of weeks, we remained above 4,300. As long as that's still how I would describe the chart of the S&P 500, then I'm not worried. And I'm not worrying too much about downside projections and getting super defensive because the trend by that simple definition is still up. Now, if we would continue higher, then you need to keep bumping that level higher, right? And thinking about, all right, what's that? You know, all right, we make a new high, then what's that next uh, line in the sand? It's kind of like bumping up a trailing stop and continuing to lock in those paper gains and just having a level at which point you agree to revisit the thesis. By the way, if you're a stock charts uh, member, which of course you should be, but if you uh, if you are not, uh, think about it because what we would do is I would go to an alert and basically set a price alert, particularly on um, when the price of the S and P gets below 4,300 or whatever major benchmark you're looking at and whatever key level it is. That is what I would do. Say S and P 500 crosses below 4,300, have it text you, and then don't worry another moment about the overall trend, because as long as we hold above that on a, pl- on a pullback, the trend overall is still positive. And I think that's an important thing to remember about leveraging uh, so, uh, tools like stock charts to uh, let you worry less and focus more on other things. All right, a couple more charts here before we finish off. I did want to talk about just the VIX. And again, I get, I get questions on the VIX pretty often just uh, because it's so different than what we've experienced, right? The VIX over the last 18 months, and, and think, uh, you know, sort of March 2023 and further to the left, back to the beginning of 2022, the volatility picture was a little more elevated, right? We're at 20. 20 was a low VIX level back in 2022, and 35 was a high VIX level. Those are completely different numbers here in 2023. In March, we had that spike up to a VIX just above 30, but overall, we've been very, very low. And in the last month, we've actually gone below the 2021 low. And that was a period of what I would describe as low volatility. Now, you can take a chart like this and go really far back if you want to. You probably want to make it more of a uh, a weekly chart or something. Uh, This is a little noisier than you really need to make it. But when you do that, you'll note that 2020 and 2021 were actually kind of an aberration. 2022 as well. All of this range, the last three years, is still way elevated relative to what the normal range of the VIX was. Look back in 2017, and you'll see the VIX actually got down to single digits and spent about half the year below 10. Um, Back here in 2014, we touched current levels and actually went a little bit below there and actually spent a decent amount of time there. These were kind of slow and steady inclines. They're kind of compressed because of the rally that we've seen here. If I took some time and made a log scale, it would look a little bit better. But what you have to remember is during periods of of steady inclines, you will have low volatility and the VIX can remain low. 
And the reason why I point that out is I've had people mention, all right, the VIX is down at 15. Is that a, is that a sell signal? And my, my argument would be no. I mean, maybe, but, but, but certainly not a, a system I would think as particularly robust because what you're doing is comparing where we're at relative to a period of very high volatility. Bring in more data and you'll see actually volatility can remain particularly low in a sustained bull market phase. And looking for a change, looking for a period of low volatility that changes, it's what's the most important signal to wait for. So I would say the VIX popping up from here is the most important indication when you're thinking of this chart. And, and we're not seeing that yet. We're continuing to see fairly low volatility uh, for sure. Now, you know, a chart of the Qs is a, is a good, good place to, uh, to go next. When we think about the strength in sort of those FANG stocks, I think the QQQ is, is as good a way as any to sort of focus on the mega cap growth trade. These are the, you know, 100 large names sort of concentrated in those, uh, in those growth sectors. And the trend is positive. Now, now how, how would I, why would I say the trend is positive? Charles Dow, trend following 101, higher highs and higher lows. As long as that keeps happening, as long as you can continue to describe the chart of the Qs in that way, the trend is positive, right? And then we were coming off of a new swing high just above 370. We pulled back to around 357, we'll call it. And now we're rotating higher a little bit. Watch that trend on that shorter term time frame. Continue to watch that. When that changes, that's when you need to start thinking about the potential of a retracement, the potential of a, of a deeper pullback, and some of the downside objectives. Worth noting, by the way, you don't see any sort of divergence yet, right? The momentum in mid-June was higher than it was in early June. So instead of a bullish move on weaker momentum, what we call a bearish momentum divergence, you're not getting that. You're actually seeing the price moving higher on stronger momentum. That's actually more the sign of a stronger market environment, not a weaker market environment. The last thing I'm going to show you, maybe we'll see how many charts I can get in here in the, in the next minute or two. But I did want to point out the McClellan Oscillator, super noisy. So we're actually, I didn't have a time to change the color, but we're right back above zero. Now, what's happened actually a number of times when you have a bearish phase is you have these brief moves above the zero line and then right back. So I think tomorrow, actually, uh, at, at the close today, we'll be able to lock in the latest, uh, the latest value here. This isn't updated for today's close just yet because we're, uh, we're scrubbing the, uh, the closing data from the exchanges. But overall, uh, looking to see if this can remain above zero, that would be another bullish development, um, you know, kind of uh, changing what was a sort of a dangerous combination. We had the bullish percent index for the NASDAQ 100 give a sell signal last week. Um, as of last Friday, then McClellan oscillators going below zero is a lot of signs of uh, internal weakness now maybe starting to be alleviated as you're seeing a bit of a rally through the course of the day today. That might be a chart to watch. This is on the Mindful Investor Live chart list, along with a lot of the other uh, macro sort of big picture charts that we like to show on the final bar. That's it for our market recap. I'm going to bring on our guest today, Adrian Zadunczyk, here in a moment. Before we do so, I just wanted to remind you, questions are always welcome. We're going to do a mailbag segment uh, on Friday's show of this week. We'd love to feature one of your questions on our show. Email us your questions. That's always the best way. The final bar at stockcharts.com. And I would encourage you, put a little permalink. If you're using the Stock Charts platform, below the sharp charts, you'll see a little permalink button on ACP. The lower left corner has a little arrow that'll send me the hyperlink. I can see a live version of the chart that you're asking about. On Twitter, we're at Final Bar SCTV. And of course, on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear your comments and your feedback, and especially your questions. I want to bring on today's guest, Adrian Zadunczyk. Adrian's the founder of The Burb Nest, coming to us from Poland. And Adrian, as always, thank you so much for staying up a little late and uh, giving our viewers uh, some of your expertise. How are you these days? All right? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Dave. I drank a lot of coffee. I'm fully <laughs> excited. I'm fully, fully, fully ready to get right, you know, kick it, kick it right in. We are wired and ready to go here. So I'm very interested. Of course, I know you you have a good experience focusing on the cryptocurrency markets. You actually did some really cool educational content for us, which I think we're excited to share with our with our viewers here very soon. Let's chart with the start with the chart of uh, of Bitcoin. It's been a choppy market. It's been a noisy market. But overall, how are you feeling about the trends uh, here at the end of June? Makes sense. Uh, well, this is this is arguably one of the cleanest examples of how technical analysis works in practice. This is the chart that probably should go into the textbooks about the, about the technical analysis, technical works of cryptocurrencies. If you have a look, it's a very clean, re really, really clean example of uh, of many confirmation points and techniques, right? So we're talking about the confirmed bull market. And ever since 2023 started, we've been seeing and looking at this major significant market rotation to the upside. 
early January, there was a significant breakout, you know, over the critical round number of $20,000 that aligned basically with the 200 day moving average, which uh, represents the actual primary market tendency, right? AKA the bull market or the bear market. So if the line inclines and it continues to do so for a long time, right now it's going to be about two, three months. Then uh, is this really a chance? Is this really random? Well, the answer is, of course, not, right? Because if a $600 billion asset continues to move and uh, climb steadily, you know, for the past for the past couple of months on a regular basis, on average, and this average continues to even accelerate and gain on the slope, arguably, we are talking about an accelerating early, still early, yet accelerating phase of the bull market, right? So uh, this is also the, the phase at the early stages of reversal when the biggest amount of cognitive dissonance there is, right? And I'm paraphrasing the CMT curriculum over there. The greatest amount of the cognitive dissonance actually bothers us when the, at the early stages of the reversal where we cannot still accept a new reality that we are in. I still talk to so many people on a daily basis who are caught in the outdated bear market frames. They still continue to expect those lower numbers and what the market does, it just continues to climb higher, right? So this is very, 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 I think, you know, uh, very, we need to be very mindful about those those types of biases, behavioral biases. So on the technical side, I love focusing on the left-hand side of the chart because those are facts. I love relying mm. on the facts. I hate relying on opinions. I'd lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on my faulty predictions <laughs> and wrong opinions. So I'm not going to do it anymore. And in, instead, I'm just focusing again on the technicals, right? So mm. the breakout itself, uh, we are talking about the recent, mo the most recent breakout and why it's confirmed. We're talking about the volume burst, right? Uh, right at the, at the day of the breakout when Bitcoin was breaking this $27,000 region uh, that aligned with the diagonal resistance, call it trend line. Uh, it actually provided a nice spike in volume, nice elevated spike in volume, which is good to have. It's not something obligatory on the breakouts. Most of the breakouts, especially on the early stages of the bull runs, you know, they tend to occur on lower interest and lower volume on, uh, well, on a nominal um, scale, if you will. However, there is this significant boost and this significant boost on the volume uh, tells you that it's relevant. On top of that, we are talking about the 20 day breath spike, the overall mm. 20, 50 day and uh, 200 day breath spike. Uh, it's not going to be in this chart. Uh, however, the amount of the number of coins, cryptocurrencies moving, you know, above their relative, their res respective trend lines, uh, the 20-day trend, 50-day trend, and the 200-day trend increases, right? And there is the significant spike from, if I'm not mistaken, 5% uh, to over 70% of the coins being above their 200-day trends uh, just on the past couple of days, right? So this is a whole movement that is accompanying Bitcoin on the move up, which is, uh, well, aka called the breath confirmation. On top of that, we are looking at the volatility confirmation, right? So the volatility is the type of movement uh, that is actually, again, needed to develop those almost vertical tails. And that's what Bitcoin loves to do most and best. In times, except of the times that it moves super in a very super sluggish mode, very sideways, uh, it tends to rally or, well, dump aggressively and very aggressively and very vertically. This is typical of Bitcoin, right? So when you when it finally gets outside of a range, it really ver rallies often vertically. So the volatility mm. confirmation with the ATR still above its relative 50-day average. Price percentage traveled overall from the uh, low, pre-breaker low of 24,800s all the way to the new highs of 31,400s. Uh, gives you about 28% rally. So again, if a 600 billion capitalization market moves by 28% in just no time, can it really be due to the chance, right? Mm. Arguably not. That's a, uh, that's then a moving real on number, to, right? That's correct. Uh, moving on real quick, you know, to the price action itself, just like you mentioned, uh, very concept, concepts of the Dow theory, you know, higher highs, higher lows, this is, this is there. Uh, times, you know, we, we've got eight, nine days spent above the critical resistance breakout, right? So again, if it maintains those levels and it just doesn't, refuses to come back below the resistance, it's real, it's valid. Uh, on top of that momentum at the bottom, right, there is a side relative strength index. And it's just kind of like slipped below 70. However, it's still main remaining in the upper region, mm. unseen basically since, uh, since you know, the earlier uh, quarter, late, late quarter one. Uh, periods we are talking about support resistance levels arguably those round number encores that we tend to wrap our our minds around them 30000 seems to be the psychological level that we naturally would expect however the market is willing this is show, showing this willingness to persist higher uh breaking higher to the new highs 31 broken 31400 right now local peak arguably 
the next round number is 40K. Who knows? Maybe the prices will gravitate towards that right direction. This is so helpful, Adrian. And what, what I, what's so refreshing about your just discussion, there was, it was like a brief masterclass in technical analysis. You hit on so many things. But what's so funny about the cryptocurrency space, there's so many narratives, right? There's regulatory pressures. There's new ETFs being filed. At the end of the day, why not a nice, consistent technical approach? Is the trend positive? And I think you've made a really good case as for how we've seen that rotation. I want to briefly, if we could, Adrian, talk about two other markets, because uh, you had some other good charts that I want to share with us. Just real quickly, if we could. The energy sector has been one that's been beaten down. And this is uh, you know top performing sector today. Still arguably a lot to prove. Do you see something to like in this chart? Or is it still time to be leaning away, given the trend overall? Hmm. That's actually a very interesting chart, to be honest, right? Because ever since the dollar picked, you know, somewhere mid, uh, mid through, you know, midway through through 2022 for the bear market, you know, we've seen energy start slowing down very mm. significantly, and we've sh we've shifted. I think we are we are not looking. Well, this is arguably, I may, of course, may be wrong, so take it with a grain of salt. I don't know what's happening on the right hand side of the chart. <laughs> there are there is again many many black swans, you know, potential. Uh, up there, you know, for the Russia-Ukraine war, and we know, of course, that Russia, along with their partners, collaborators, you know, is is rich with the resources on the oil side, on the energy side. So they are in control a little bit of a supply. So uh, agreeing, you know, assuming that nothing changes on that scene, uh, I would argue that you know energy has slowed down significantly, right? So mm -hmm. the 2020 COVID year, you know, gave, gave a very decent, significant burst, you know, above the 200-day moving average. Again, representing the primary bull market trend. This bull market trend significantly slows down right now. And what is, I think, relevant are are two critical factors. Well, first of all, we are spending almost 60 calendar days below the 200-day moving average. And the last time it happened was before the bull market started, mm. right? So this tells me again that the market is willing to stay longer below the average. It's underperforming its long-term long average, uh, arguably again, expressing certain preference or lack of preference when compared with the S&P 500. And that translates to the upper side of the chart, uh, where we're looking at the relative strength ratio, right? So uh, of course, huge shout out to to Jeff uh, to Jeff Hirsch for all the seasonal studies that I'm going to bring up soon, uh, as well as Julius the Campanar for you know for my my big big uh, look up to person you know, for anything relative strength. Uh, and looking at the new lows being printed on a consecutive, consequent basis, you know, for the uh, XLE, this tells me that there is decreasing interest on the among investors to pick up the energy when compared with the S&P 500. So relative strength has this feature that quite often it precedes the price, just like it happened with the bottom boundary of the symmetric triangle somewhere in the middle of a chart, mm. right? Right where the ratio broke out, the price actually was at the bottom of the of the uh, boundary. And uh, by basically buying into the ratio breakout, you know, you would have bought the bottom of the symmetrical triangle at that time. So again, this may precede the price. Um, new lows are being printed on a quite a regular basis. This is a continued valid downward trend. This tells me that again, the interest among investors is declining. It is in heavy decline. Arguably, this will translate eventually to a declining demand, hence less cushion to support the prices. So just maybe the new lows are coming for the energy, which conversely is positive for Bitcoin. Cheaper energy prices, more disposable income for investors, mm. better risk on environment uh, capabilities. Bitcoin also thrives on cheap energy, better profitability for the miners. Uh, this definitely puts us in the right context for the halving that is coming for Bitcoin uh, in, the, in the April 2024 that typically drives the fundamental scarcity and prices up. That is so fascinating. And I really I, I like that approach or, or that um, that illustration of how the relative strength, the relative performance of the sector versus the benchmark often precedes or is almost a leading indicator for um, for the trend itself. That's actually a really interesting comparison to, uh, to make there. We only have about 30 seconds left, but I'd love to just talk about offense versus defense. I know a lot of people are skeptical of market upside with the run that we've had so far. When you look at the consumer space, Thumbs up or thumbs down? What's the trend in your perspective here? Thumbs up it is, it seems, right? <laughs> Consumers are thriving. Uh, the, risk on, the risk on is actually, again, thriving. And that's not my opinion. That's actually what is in the chart, right? Mm. So the market rotation has been present since 2023. Clear, very distinct, apparent trend to the upside. Uh, the average is yet to catch up. The 200-day relative, uh, relative strength trend is yet to catch up and inverse. Higher, however, we continue to print relative, uh, relatively valid breakouts, right? Bullish relative trend breakout. 
uh, above 215 for the for the ratio XLY versus XLP, we continue to make new highs, right? And we are in the most positive bullish context pre-election years you know, following the midterm bear markets, 83 to 84 odds, you know, 98.8% probability that this year closes bullish, hence extends the bull market. Shout out to Jeff Hirsch. And uh, and I'd say that, you know, we are in a very, very strong bullish environment. And mm. now we are just seeing results of it in an early stage. Adrian, this was awesome. Three great charts, some really good perspective as always. Really appreciate you sharing some thoughts with us uh, from Poland. Get some sleep, sing well, play well, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thank you so much. I'm learning from the best, Dave. <laughs> That's Adrian Zidunczyk. Adrian's the founder of The Burb Nest. And again, has done such a fantastic job of, of, I think, promoting some really good best practices in technical analysis. When you think about how Adrian was laying out the case, talking about why should we be bullish on a chart like Bitcoin? It comes down to the price and the trend and what signal the market provides back to us. That's the essence of what we're trying to empower you uh, to do using a platform like Stock Church is to really learn the lessons the market, learn the information the market is providing back to us. Great take there by Adrian Zadunczyk, founder of The Burb Nest. Folks, we have to wrap the show and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. We're looking at the S&P market trend in Adrian's, uh, in, in, in a nod to Adrian's great take, I think, on following the trend and recognizing it. When people ask me, what's the take on the S&P? I like to have a very simple approach looking at the market trend. Now, what I do with a market trend model, which I use often, is looking at three different time frames and just doing a simple analysis. Is the trend positive or negative? It is a binary check. At this point, the trend is positive on all three time frames. The short term is a couple days to a couple weeks. The medium term is a couple months. The long term is maybe a, a year, a couple of years. And it's, it's as simple as that. And it's just looking at that trend. What's interesting is as a market tops out, the way that this pretty much always goes is the short term model registers a sell signal in that initial rotation. And then instead of being a brief pullback, it ends up being a little more meaningful and the medium term model turns negative. And then eventually, if it's a really dramatic secular decrease, the long term model will turn negative. At this point, when it's all positive, it tells me be playing this, be thinking of this as a risk on environment until the market tells me to think otherwise. At this point, I would say, uh, you know, uh, it's sort of a still a thumbs up positive across the board. Again, the trend remains uh, strong. Chart number two, I, it's an overused phrase, but I had to go good, the bad and the ugly thinking about three areas of the market. Our, our poll question we asked you recently was what ETF performs best. And we had some things like clean energy, like oil and gas producers, uh, like gold, and then FANG stocks. And I want to show you the S&P 500. Look at the trend that we've seen in the SPY over the last six to eight months. Compare that to the trend we've seen in the XOP. Now, again, bouncing off of a low level, bouncing a bit here, but still, I would say, at best, sort of in a consolidation phase, not enough of a rotation based on most uh, trend analysis to confirm a new uptrend just yet clean energy in a clear downtrend of lower lows and lower highs. What's great about the charts is they will tell you what the trends are. If you have a consistent process, you can define the trend using trend lines, using moving averages, using a simple analysis uh, based on the highs and the lows. And overall, I think you have three very different trends based on these three areas. Be focused on what defines that trend and when that trend is changed, what I call a change of character. And I would say at this point, those three trends seem to be persisting. Finally, the Food Products Index. This is one of the worst performers in, the, uh, uh, in our Dow industry group work uh, today. And probably in the last week, I would be hard pressed to come up with an example of something that's probably underperforming this space. Because if you look at the names that are struggling, it's uh, in the US, it's names like General Mills and Campbell's Soup and Hormel, kind of the, the, the companies that produce the food you have in your pantry. These are stocks that are struggling. The uh, Food Products Group is actually just closing below its 200 day moving average today, but the relative strength has been deteriorating. Overall, it's been a weak 2023. But particularly over the last uh, six to eight weeks, we've seen a real rotation away from the food product space. With a group like this, I think focusing on the relative strength is a really good idea because when the relative strength turns higher, that's when it tells you that investors are starting to rotate into those names. Until then, these are stocks that are struggling in areas where investors are not rotating. And that is not what an uptrend is made of. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us on the final bar every weekday after the close. Special thank you to Adrian Zadunczyk of The Burb Nest, joining us remotely from Poland and sharing some thoughts on cryptos and the equity space. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a great night.